Welcome back, everyone. I pray you had a wonderful weekend. As we continue through our readings and reflections this week, I want to turn our attention to our readings from Genesis, and particularly the story of Joseph and Potiphar in Genesis 39. Now, for those of you who maybe have not been reading along in Genesis. There is quite a backstory here for Joseph. Joseph is the son of Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. Early on, Joseph starts having dreams of grandeur. Not dreams as in hopes, but actual dreams uh, in which he envisions that his older brothers and even his parents will in time bow to his greatness. Not exactly enthralled with these grandiose visions, Joseph's brothers plot against him, at first to kill him and then later to sell him off into slavery, and that's where we come around to the Ishmaelites. There's a subtle note of intrigue at play here, because remember, Remember back to the story of Isaac and Ishmael, the two sons of Abraham. Isaac is God's late-in-life late gift through whom Abraham will become the father of many nations, while Ishmael is, and his mother are sent away. So now we're two generations later, and we have Isaac's grandson, Joseph, being sold into Ishmael's clan. But despite that confluence of events, they don't actually end up keeping him very long, but end up selling Joseph to one of Pharaoh's leading men in Egypt. That's Potiphar. Fairly quickly, Potiphar sees the blessings that come with Joseph's presence, and really th with God's presence with Joseph. So Potiphar promotes him within the household, and he puts him in charge of everything. Potiphar's wife, on the other hand, had a different idea in mind. Joseph rebuffs her advances repeatedly. She grows frustrated, keeps pushing towards him, at one point grabs onto him. He runs off from her grasp, leaving his cloak behind, and she then uses that cloak to make a false accusation against him in claiming that he was, in fact, the aggressor and she the aggrieved. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 19 of Genesis 39. Genesis writes, when, when his master, that being Potiphar, heard the words that his wife spoke to him, saying, this is the way your servant treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confirmed, and he remained there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care. Because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Now, from here we will proceed, or the story proceeds into the next chapter of Joseph's tale as his God given gift of interpreting dreams continues to guide his way all the way into the innermost circle of Pharaoh himself. But for today, it was that last line, that 23rd verse, that really stood out to me. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, because the Lord was with him. Whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. It actually shows up twice. In verse 21, it's stated even more succinctly. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. 
in just these few short verses, there is this clear and distinct focus on the fact that despite the nature and strife of Joseph's journey, God was there every step of the way. And it was that focus that really jumped out to me as I considered our reflections for today. Now, I don't mean to imbue the focus of the narrative onto the heart and mind of Joseph. This portion of the story doesn't really speak much to what Joseph is thinking or how he's feeling in all of this. But I do think it's worth noting that the central thematic concept that arises as Joseph goes to prison is God's presence with him while he's there. Remember, this is a man who grew in the affection of his father only to be nearly killed by his brothers and then eventually sold by them into slavery. This was a man who was traded by the Ishmaelites into Potiphar's house, who then evolved into in stature in the household only to be falsely accused by Potter's wife, Potiphar's wife, and now a man who just moments after he was resting in such great privilege and opportunity is thrown into the dungeon and imprisoned for something he never did. There is, there are a, a lot of things on which one might focus in that moment. Woe is me. How could this happen to me? This isn't right. This isn't fair. This is not what I deserve. She wronged me. She lied. He should have known better. I could go on and on and on. There are so many things on which one might focus in this moment of Joseph's life, but the narrative really just ignores them all. There's no self-pity. There's no blame game. There's no retreading of who was right and who was wrong. There's no self-indulgent victimization of the martyred hero. There is simply the bold, foremost, and unconditional affirmation that God is there. As I read that story and as I think about that affirmation, I just find myself wondering how often we might benefit from embracing such a perspective of our own. How often do we find ourselves in circumstances that are less than ideal, in struggles not of our own making, and allow our hearts and minds to march down that path of self-indulgent victimization? How often do we tread and retread those journeys of self-pity during which we dwell on all that has been done to us? And how often do we set all that aside? Simply allow ourselves to rest in the promise that it doesn't matter where we are, it doesn't matter how we got there, and it doesn't matter who it is that got us there, because God is there. That's the perspective that this narrative takes as Joseph is placed into prison. And I just find myself wondering how often we might benefit from embracing just such a perspective of our own. Let's join in prayer together. Gracious God, help us. Help us to see the ceaseless presence that you offer to our every moment or of our every day. Help us to look beyond the struggle of the moment or the blame of the day to see that you are now and that you are always with us. Help us, God, to open our hearts to the presence of your Spirit that we may, may forever find rest in the blessing of your care. For we pray it in his name. Amen.
The next time I am with you all, it will be July. Um, time is coming upon us very quickly, but my blessings to all of you for a wonderful week, and I will see you on Thursday.